I'd like to hand over to uh, uh, Christian, who's going to talk about spirit level. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you got it here. got it here. Well, thank you, David, for that kind uh, introduction. <laughs> kind of. Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the book, The Spirit Level, but in case you're not, it's not a problem because it's easy to explain, the gist of it at least. The main thesis is just that almost all social problems, health problems that we have in the developed world are caused by income inequality. That's the spirit level in one sentence. And their methodology is they use about 40 scatter plots where you have a measure of inequality on the horizontal axis, and then you've got a measure of some social problem on the vertical axis, a prevalence of something like homicides, um, mental disorders, all sorts of, of things. And um, then you've got about 30 data points, each representing one country, and you always seemingly get this positive association, showing that Apparently, the more unequal a society is, the worse everything gets. You got higher rates of homicide, of uh, mental disorders, of all sorts of social and mental and, and health problems. And um, this book has been hugely successful so far. It's been translated into a couple of languages and uh, it's received rave reviews everywhere on the national newspapers and uh, politicians are quoting it all the time. David Cameron has referred to it in a very favorable way. So it is, you could say in a sense, the book, the political book of the day. Now so far, there has not been an explicitly libertarian response to it, as far as I'm aware. And maybe that's just because at the face of it, it doesn't sound necessarily very exotic, that thesis. It sounds like a conventional social democratic case, this idea that a more equal society is somehow a more humane, nicer place to live. And um, if you look at it superficially, it looks just like a, like a repetition or an extension of this conventional social democratic case. But actually that is a mistake. I think there should be a libertarian response because Spirit level egalitarianism is a much more authoritarian mindset than social democracy. So, compared to spirit level egalitarianism, some kind of uh, third way Blairite or so is almost an ally. Uh, this is a much more statist authoritarian philosophy, and uh, for that reason, I think it should be addressed. Now, I'm not going to talk about the spirit level as such because the spirit level is not a book that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. It's rather a book that builds on lines of thinking which have been there well before, and it's just summarizing them and uh, extending, building upon them. One of those line of thoughts is happiness economics. That is effectively the idea that governments can measure happiness and fine-tune it, make us all happier by pulling the right kind of policy of levers. That's uh, effectively happiness economics. Goes back to an observation made in the 1970s by a number of uh, economic papers where early happiness economists were looking at the relationship between GDP and self-reported happiness. So they took data from large-scale surveys, asking people, how do you rate your life satisfaction on a scale from, say, one to five or something? And then they looked at the relationship between that variable and GDP per capita and found the following pattern. They found that self-reported happiness rises with economic development, but only up to a certain point, only up to rather minimal level of, of, uh, of prosperity, and from then on it runs flat. From then on, increasing prosperity further does not seem to make people any happier. So that would mean if a very poor place, say Afghanistan, could double their GDP per capita, 
then people there would probably report much higher levels of life satisfaction. But if GDP per capita doubled in the UK, or even tripled, there would be no impact on self-reported aggregate happiness. That's the observation they made. That is the so-called Easterlin paradox. So what they asked was, if greater prosperity doesn't make us any more, any more happy, then why are we actually striving for it? Why are we striving for more if it fails to make us happy? Why don't we just lean back and enjoy what we have without worrying about getting more? And they found an answer for that. They gave an answer. They were also looking at distribution of happiness within societies. And they found that within any given society, at some point in time, wealthier people were always happier, according to their own account, than their less wealthy counterparts. So the conclusions they were drawing from that is that it doesn't matter how prosperous you are, it matters how prosperous you are in relative terms. People don't want to be wealthy, according to their explanation, People want to be wealthier than others, regardless of what that means in absolute terms. So that would apply to the United States, just in the same way as to Portugal, right? because they have similar distributions of income, but uh, very different levels. So according to that explanation, the uh, middle class Portuguese would be happier on average than the relatively poor American even if the relatively poor American can afford many goods and services that uh, the middle-class Portuguese cannot afford, but the relatively poor American would compare badly to those around him, while the middle-class Portuguese would uh, compare favorably to those around him. And people are, according to that explanation, only interested in the relative picture. So if that was the case, there would be a bit of a problem. Because we can have a situation easily where everybody gets better off in absolute terms. That's what happens in a growing economy over time, of course. But we cannot have a situation in which everybody gets better off in relative terms. Or, as one happiness economist phrased it, society as a whole cannot improve its position relative to itself. And that's a challenge for free market economists, of course. Because free market economists have tried to explain for more than 200 years why economic activities in a market economy are not zero-sum games. Well, my gain is not your loss. We can both gain. But that is only true under the assumption that uh, people strive for goods and services because they enjoy consuming them, because it's useful, because it's comfortable. But in the mindset of the happiness economist, people just strive for goods and services in order to signalize a position relative to somebody else. So if, say, in that explanation, if you try to increase your income, say by working longer hours or upgrading your skills, you're not really doing this because you want the bigger flat. You might think that that's what you want, but your true hidden preferences that you're unaware of would be you want the bigger flat just to signalize to others that you can afford it. But if every flat in the country uh, suddenly doubled in size overnight, you wouldn't get any extra use from it because the flat would not have the capacity to signalize status because your relative position would be unchanged. That would be the the contention of the happiness economist. And in that sense, economic growth actually is like a zero-sum game. And uh, in their interpretation, the market economy is just a big coordination failure. You think of it in with uh, using the following metaphor. Um, I'm sure this, is, this has happened to a lot of people. Imagine you go to the airport and you arrive at the gate well before the time that the 
the plane takes off. So you have half an hour left. So initially everybody is comfortable, everybody is sitting around, having a cup of tea, reading. And now suddenly one person stands up and starts to form a queue. Then other people observe that, jump up as well. And then everybody starts to panic, everybody runs into the queue. And uh, this would be a classical coordination failure, which is uh, a behavior which is irrational from the perspective of the group, because total boarding time has not decreased by one second, but everybody is less comfortable in that half hour. And for the happiness economist, that is more or less a metaphor that describes the market economy as a whole. I'm slightly simplifying, but if you look at the sources, you, you will see that uh, is not actually a misrepresentation. So within that metaphor for them, that person uh, starting to, to uh, form the queue unnecessarily, that would be the people who try to increase their income and their level of, of consumption, their living standards, and then other people would try to imitate that, and then everybody starts to panic because nobody wants to be seen as left behind, and we would get up, we would we would end up in a suboptimal uh, outcome. So this is this is a bit like a prisoner's dilemma then in game theory, where in the end people end up totally overworked, overstressed, neglecting their social life. And in exchange, they just have a lot of goods and services that they don't actually want. They just feel pressurized that they must have them. Okay, that is uh, happiness economics in a nutshell. Now back to the spirit level proper. The spirit level can be placed in that context. Um, the conventional happiness economists have called for remedying this situation in the same way that you would remedy a coordination failure in, in most cases. You would need an external coordinator for the happiness economist. That would be, surprise, surprise, the government. Government would use tax policy and other policies to discourage people from working and consuming too much, try to move them to the optimum. So what they were advocating, say, Richard Layard, LSE, uh, would advocate high marginal tax rates. Marginal because that's where, where of course, it matters for, for work incentives. Uh, specifically designed so to discourage people from working long hours. Uh, and the same goes for consumption taxes, high consumption taxes on non-essential goods and services to get people, as they call it, off the consumer th treadmill. Uh, help people acting according to their true preferences by getting them out of this uh, vicious rat race. That's the conventional happiness economics uh, case. Now the spirit level is, say, an extension, a top up of that. They, the authors, Wilkins and Pickett, would say, yes, that's all well and good, happiness economics so far, fine with us, but it doesn't stop here. It goes well beyond. The happiness economists are just worried about people's work-life balance. They're just saying okay, people end up with too many working hours and are spending too little, too little time in their community or family. Wilkinson and Pickett, spirit level authors, would say, well, it's more than that. This status race itself is what drives people mad. That's where all those social and health problems come from. Is this constant stress of comparing yourself to others and trying to keep up with others and worrying about where do I stand relative to, to others, where do I stand in the income distribution and so on. They're saying that is what makes people, uh, what affects people's health so badly and that is why uh, we get all those poor social outcomes and unequal societies. I'm saying the more unequal a society is, the more intense this kind of status competition becomes. And that's why people turn towards destructive behavior and destructive towards themselves or to others and you get an increase in all those problems. Now they're saying then of course that's why we have to get rid of inequality so that we stop people from competing with each other. We stop this 
type of status competition. And we somehow make sure that we get a nicer society which is more cooperative and less uh, confrontative. That's one, one of the main pillars of the spirit level, uh, one of those um, undercurrents that I refer to implicitly, but that have been there well before, well before the spirit level was, was even uh, thought of. The second big pillar is steady state economics, which is essentially a neo Malthusian economics. It's this idea that uh, we are, well, that economic growth, that population growth, are destroying the planet because we're using up too much of the biosphere biocapacity, as they call it, where we're using up all the world's, the world's resources and we're polluting too much. And uh, for that reason, they envision major catastrophes ahead. And uh, they're saying, we have to remedy this situation by creating a non-growing economy. That's a steady state economy. That's an economy where the government is controlling the major inputs energy, resources, and it does that in such a way that the growth rate of the economy is always zero. So you freeze the level of economic output at uh, or the point of transition. You keep it there, freeze it, and coordinate uh, the input of resources in such a way that this holds. Okay. Now they're not very specific on how exactly they do that. There's several proposals here. Um, it's called a growth policy. That's how they stop growth. It's a deep growth policy. A growth policy. Oh, okay. A uh, deep policy for growth <laughs> stops growth. It usually has the effect of not having it. Unintended consequences of growth. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe they're hidden allies. It's just like the Monopoly Commission hides Monopoly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, um, okay, well, one, one of the policies that, that they're prescribing or that, that, that uh, the steady state economists are uh, proposing for that end is a system of carbon rationing, <laughs> where everybody gets a carbon allowance. You get a kind of a rationing book, you could call it. And whenever you buy something, some uh, amount is deducted from your carbon allowance. So that would be an incentive to switch towards a low consumption, low carbon consumption lifestyle, because once you've used up your allowance, your lights go out and your heating goes off. So. If you go to a supermarket, then you would um, well, you would have to produce your your carbon rationing book, uh, like a well, like a Tesco club card, but just in reverse, where um, every product has a carbon carbon figure attached to it. So if you buy tropical fruits, then they would deduct quite a lot. If you just buy potatoes and onions from the local farmers, then your deduction would be smaller. So your incentive would be leave the tropical fruits where they are and go for potatoes and onions from your local farmer. Or if you do something really sinful, like foreign holiday, then you would have to cut back extremely on something else, you know, say not, not using the shower anymore, or uh, you would have to buy somebody else's carbon allowance, and they're, they're tradable within limits in that system. That's one of the proposals which also enters uh, the spirit level. Now again, you can place the book in the context of this uh, steady state economics theory. They are squaring that circle by saying, well, okay, we have all these ecological catastrophes ahead, which is why we have to end economic growth. But here is how it fits into our book, how we how you square the circle in a society with high income inequality, you got all those status pressures and consumption pressures, so therefore the government cannot stop economic growth. You need growth in such a society to, or to, to, to compensate for the consumption pressure, but as soon as you get rid of income inequalities, people lose their interest in consumption. The assumption is people just consume because everybody else does, but if you reduce inequality, take away those status pressures, people would just lose their interest. And then you could uh, easily implement a policy like this carbon rationing, where living standards are frozen or, or even reduced, and um, people would not mind that anymore. Uh, their favorite comparison is the wartime economy, 
Uh, that, is, that is a model that they are very fond of. But well, the difference is, as one of the uh, authors criticizing Spirit Level pointed out, in the Second World War, rationing was, of course, a response, an emergency response to, to extreme scarcity. It was not the cause. Um, in that proposal, rationing would be introduced to deliberately cause scarcity, to deliberately make it uh, unpleasant to use an, an airplane. Uh, so it's not a response, but it is what causes the, the extreme scarcity in the first place. Okay, so this is where you can place the spirit level in the context of its undercurrents. It's a merger of happiness economics, steady state economics, anti-consumerism, and it has this um, this roundabout theory in the end is all about reducing inequality to reduce status pressures, therefore have less social stress and less interest in consumption. And that's why we can move to an egalitarian, non-growing, carbon-friendly um, well, economy where everybody is happy. Now, as for the responses, maybe that's more of a, of a thing for, for the question and answers part, but um, looking at how I think libertarians should respond is first to look at the empirical side of it. There have been two major publications attacking the, the empirical part of the spirit level, very compelling ones. Uh, Christopher Snowden's book, The Spirit Level Delusion, first of all, and secondly, Peter Saunders, wrote a paper called Beware False Prophets, and what they're showing is those correlations depend hugely on the type of indicator that you're picking and the countries that you include. If you make small changes to that selection, you can completely unravel the whole correlation. And if you can make a correlation go away so easily, that's, of course, that's a sign which shows that there probably is no correlation in the first place. So empirically, this uh, stands on, on thin ice. And the same goes, in a wider sense, for the happiness economics part. Uh, there are papers from happiness economists which claim the precise opposite, that you still have increases in self-reported well-being, uh, even at very high levels of, um, of economic development. But at, that, uh, at the same time, Inequality is not very relevant for aggregate um, aggregate levels of happiness. So the precise opposite of uh, what the initial, the the early happiness economists were saying. I'm not saying that these these latter types uh, of studies are necessarily right, just because they suit my argument. I'm just saying the whole business of measuring happiness is a very tricky business, and it surely does not provide a justification for heavily intervening in other people's lives uh, on the basis of a few scatter plots. Uh, just imagine we were following these policies and stopped economic growth based on that, and then in, in 20 years it turns out that uh, it was just that the data was wrong and uh, we've thrown away 20 years for nothing. So it's a very risky thing and uh, it doesn't um, really justify heavy interventions into people's private lives. That's another part. Then, on the point of, uh, of steady state economics, Malthusian economics, well, I think it's just wrong for the same reason that Thomas Malthus was wrong originally. Now, it's the same kind of um, fallacy where they just extrapolate a current trend into the future without considering the possibility that we might overcome limitations by responding to scarcity signals and uh, that in an economy where you have property rights and free market entry and so on, that we shouldn't actually worry about um, current imbalances. Most markets are in an imbalance most of the time, but mostly that does not mean that there's a catastrophe ahead. It just means we're getting some response that we don't know yet exactly what it will look like. But then the response to scarcities, be it of, national, uh, of, of natural resources or anything else, would not be to have some consumption police uh, counting how many tropical fruits we buy, but rather 
entrepreneurship, creative uh, dynamic development here and markets and uh, property rights, of course. What else? Then there's this idea of um, consumption serving no other purpose rather than signalizing status, essentially showing off to other people. Well, what, what is undisputed is that there is such a thing as conspicuous consumption. There is standard microeconomics, there is a type of good called Veblen goods, a positional good, which just ser serves to, to show off to other people. But of course, that's a very special case. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a specific name for it. If we could measure conspicuous consumption as a proportion of, uh, of total national consumption, which we can't, of course, because we would have to know people's motivation for buying stuff, which we don't. But if we could, I'm sure it would be some relatively minor uh, percentage, just a fraction of the total. And if you look at how people actually behave at uh, actual consumption patterns, like the Family Resource Survey has good data on that, people don't behave as the spirit levelers describe them. Uh, these types of neurotic shopaholics that uh, think of nothing else than signalizing status, they must be a very small minority because for if you look at an average household's consumption pattern, most of the stuff that we buy is not visible to others. You know, there is, people don't behave as you would expect them to behave under that hypothesis. So it's just generalizing some very special case, uh, which even if it exists, also does not justify creating a totally new um, economic system. So those would be kind of the libertarian responses to spirit level, egalitarianism, happiness economics, steady state economics that uh, I would propose. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Lots, I should think. Uh, a quick one. It's rhetorical, but you can you an answer. Uh, do these people ever consider that something they might deplore, they have no right to stop? I guess not. No. I don't know them personally, but... Well, do they give any sign of it? No. Any moral qualms? No. It's just uh, Benthamite consequentialism. If we can increase the happiness by whatever hmm. interventions, then it's. Okay. Paul? Yeah, uh, well, part of what's wrong with their theory is that it seems it's a statistical sleight of hand, like uh, of like poverty. Why, after all this, uh, all the progress we've had is there still poverty? It's because it's defined relatively. So it's, it's, in effect, unless you're going to have absolutely everybody equal, which is their intention, uh, you're never going to get rid of poverty because they define poverty relative to the rich people. And similarly, yes. happiness is defined. So the only possible solution to having some people more happy than others is to have everybody equal. And, <coughs> and once, you can always kill the miserable. Well, yeah, and, and, once, and once everybody is equally happy, whatever that means, nobody would know how happy they were because there's nothing to, there's nothing to compare it with. Um, apart from the, the, the obvious silly things, you know, uh, it, it, uh, you know, people would just simply compete. If it wasn't consumptive, people would, uh, people would still uh, find reasons to be upset about other people. It's part of human nature. Things, but it's, it's, Be it's, beauty, one can't expect, athletic ability, that will have to go. One can't expect that you know, happiness is it, supposed to be, is it supposed to be a sort of an infinite scale and there's no upper limit to the amount of happiness we can have. You know, do they imagine that with more economic progress we're just end, endlessly heading towards some infinity of delirium? Uh, which, which, uh, or, or is, there, is, is there a sort of, uh, or do they imagine there's a sort of a top, a cap on happiness, the, 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 the maximum amount of happiness, you know, like wiring yourself up to a perpetual orgasmatron or something. That's, that, that's sort of, uh, that's the maximum happiness rate. Once we're all there, you know, human society stops. Um, so, I mean, there are these arguments, uh, apart from the, the idea that uh, the, the sheer stupidity as well of trying to collectivise uh, happiness uh, as an aggregate statistic across society. People act, we know, because they want to move from a, the, the situation, the, current, the psychological situation they currently find themselves in. They want to uh, remove some of the dissatisfactions they find about in their lives, move to a move themselves to a more satisfied uh, achievement. And so they, they trade, they work, they act, they do various things, they interact with other people to try and make themselves more satisfied compared to what they were. But it's, it's an ongoing process. And it will be in any one society. There is no, there is no limit to it. So, I mean, these, these seem to me to be the, the crux of uh, attacking this fatuous book. 
Yeah, that's, that's uh, two great points. It's yeah. one of the problems with uh, the happiness comparisons over time. They assume mm -hmm. that certain any point in this happiness scale always represents the same state of mind. Mm -hmm. Say a five in 1970 is a five in 2011, whereas I guess in reality uh, that scale itself yeah. could have shifted. Say if somebody uh, puts on the lowest value that there is, say a, a zero answering, yeah, my value is, is a zero, and you would ask them, okay, in that case, would you mind if we move you to, to Libya? Uh, because you cannot get any more miserable, apparently then mm -hmm. the answer would be no, 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 I mean zero in the context of what is feasible, what is realistic in this context here. Uh, but of course they're, they're well aware that uh, it could be a lot worse. Yeah, they're, they're rather like the, um, is it the bass player in Spinal Tap who's got the dial that goes up to 11 and the interviewer says, well why don't you just call 11 10 and have a go to 10? Says, yeah, but this one's 11. <laughs> the, second, the second point where you're right is that um, it's not really understandable why they they pick out income uh, comparisons so much instead of considering that you could apply the same logic to to a lot of other areas in life where you could say there people invest too much into something just because others do it and they don't want to be left behind. Some people just go to university because all their friends go. Mm. Uh, but not even an arc statist would say we should somehow discourage university education, we should have a tax on, on universities or a quantity limit or so. Uh, you, could, you, take, you could take this a lot further. You say, well, some people certainly only go to the gym because their friends go and they don't want to be left behind. So do we then introduce a gym tax and a university tax? And uh, there's, there's no, no logical end to this. I mean, the, the real evil of this book is just, it's just the latest shill argument for uh, inflicting the horrors of socialism. John? Um, criticism of Philip John Rawls was that uh, his system ought to be applied globally. Uh, nobody's going to focus on a particular country, so all the money in this country is going to go abroad. Nobody over here is going to be any better off. I mean, the same sort of argument seem to apply here. How do, they, how do they stop that? How do they say, oh, no, 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 we don't mean we should send any money to poor people abroad. Just even it out over here. That's I mean, not bad. Actually, discuss it. That's a plus. Yeah. Do they discuss it and say why? That, you know, because otherwise, it's completely arbitrary to say no, no, it's even it out over here. And mm. No, of course. Thank you very much. Well, that's that's of course one of one of the arbitrary things uh, that they automatically assume a society is what takes place within the national borders, as if you're somehow unaware of what's going on outside. But say, even if we did this when we we. Um, implemented some anti-consumption republic here, yeah. people would still see lifestyles elsewhere or would still, okay, they would probably get rid of foreign holidays, but tourists could still come over here and tell about how they live at home. So you would somehow really have to insulate the economy and make sure that nobody's exposed to more luxurious consumption. Oh yeah, when well, you're looking at it from the other point of view, I was, I was considering the poor, but you were saying some people other people who are better off than we are than uh, coming to visit us, yes. That is also a possibility. Well, it boils down to the idea that we are miserable because we observe people being wealthier than ourselves. Uh, it, and that is the part where I think the book is usually infantilizing people. You're saying that uh, you should remove that from our side because there is the possibility of, of frustration by saying that some people are more successful than you, maybe in some cases just because as a matter of, of sheer luck and undeservedly and so on. I mean, it's not part of, of adult life. And, uh, yeah. You observe that and, and, and deal with it. Just like you also observe people who are better singers than you, better runners. Speaking personally, I've always wanted more money, not so that I can look down on my neighbours, so that, so that I, I can have better neighbours. Uh, <laughs> I'm, maybe you could look up to I'm prepared to do anything to achieve that apart from work. <laughs> no, then it would be fine with the spirit levelers. As long as you don't work and thereby pressurise other people, then you can you can carry on like that. Paul? Uh, well, another, another libertarian answer to that book is that there's nothing in libertarianism that stops people going off and living on, living on a kibbutz now, if they want to. Uh, they, can, you know, they ought to want to. <laughs> they ought to want to. Yeah. Uh, they, they, people can 
club together, buy some land, till the soil, live in a hut. Uh, yeah, some people do. Uh, there are a few fanatics that do do this. Uh, it's not particularly uh, popular. And uh, the people who do it are generally driven by our geology rather than uh, and the, the happiness they get is because of the, uh, the, the psych psychological fulfillment of following their fanatical ideology more, more than anything else. Um, so if, if it was obviously more happy, if these people were obviously more happy, then people should be flocking to live in monasteries and kibbutzes and farms and things like that. But the fact that people choose not to, well, there's two solutions. Either most people are just radically deluded about what's in their own best interests. But uh, in, in that case, why, why would imposing it on them improve, improve their situation? Seems to me. But in, in libertarianism, it doesn't prevent this kind of lifestyle. It doesn't even have to go that far. You don't have to go to, to the kibbutz, but even within uh, yeah. people who live in the same city, you, we, we've got very different lifestyle groups with different say, feedback mechanisms. Some yeah. groups um, would encourage you to have, say, some expensive clothing brand in other parts of society that would be looked down upon. So you have these different response systems and it can, it can evolve in that way. That's why I was like, even if they, if they were completely right uh, in a free society, then that could just naturally develop yeah. and we would all and, and voluntarily become anti-consumerists. And, and does, to the extent the state doesn't stop it. <laughs> well, certain empirical matters, such as, uh, why do people spend a deal of money to them, where they come from, and risk their lives trying to get to a country where there's greater inequality? And worse than that, they're going to be the poor in this country. But they try to get there. Yes. Why is this? Well, because they're more interested in getting better off. Getting, getting better off. <laughs> Being better off. Yeah. <laughs> Even though they're okay. To be fair, their happiness economists could probably say, okay, they come from very poor societies, and say. this only yes, applies yes. to once you get a certain level. Yeah. You won't want to go anywhere. Yeah. 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 And also, they'd be quite happy to go into a time machine, providing their income was indexed, inflation adjusted. They'd be happy to go back to the 1950s or 40s, provided the, provided the relative incomes were the same, or would they allow that at least that you might want a higher one than a low one? It would follow logically that, that people happy. should then say, yes, I'll do it, I'll go there, as long as you can give me a guarantee that I'll be in a higher income percentile there, relatively better off. Even with the dentistry have. and the children dying at the end. Yeah. Hopefully not in the 1950s. No, 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 18, 30. Okay. Well, okay, then they would say, no, no, you have to have some minimum level. 19, 1950s could be realistic. Yeah. That's where the happiness data for, for the United States starts. They love the 1950s. That, that will be pushed up later on. You know, in a hundred years' time, they won't be talking about the 1950s. Well, they won't even be talking about today. <laughs> John? I was talking to an egalitarian woman the other day who told me that she didn't think that she was taxed enough. I said, I completely agree. I don't think you were taxed enough either. <laughs> you ought to be taxed more. But until that happens, don't you think you ought to write a cheque and send it to the tax bank? Because he won't turn it down. <laughs> he won't send it back to you. Uh, and similarly with these people, if they think it's such a good idea, should we not take, I'm sure they get more than the average income in this country, take their money and send it to these people and say, these are your principles. Um, don't you think this is now a good thing? Don't you feel a bit happier? Or does it? Or are they saying, no, 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 it has to be completely society-wide. Uh, it can't be a small step in the right direction. It's got to be everybody or nothing. Is that, is that their position? I think nobody's ever tried that, sending them a check and uh, saying, here's your voluntary impoverishment scheme. Well, no, no, what, what I'm actually suggesting is that yeah. the people sure. who are in this book, well, they, yeah. they should well, have well, their well. money taken away from them. Because they, their principles are, you know, if you're such an egalitarian, how come you're so rich? They shouldn't have the money taken away from them, and then presumably that, that, they, that should make them happier. No, they'll probably say they need the money to travel around the country and spread oh, well. the message. <laughs> yeah, <that's right>. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Mr. Gore has to. It's not that Al Gore never uses it. <laughs> he has to go to foreign conferences. Yeah. 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 Which is a fair enough point, actually. Yeah. 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 I could get my carpet so print down man's, that man's an arsehole. The Jews have to catch these big problems on It could be our bit of response that it's ending the rat race, is the point. <laughs> they are sending a check. is isn't going to end the rat race. You have to have this, this uh, array of taxes, prohibitions, compulsion. The rest of it. I suppose yeah. they say. Is anyone else who wants to speak? 
I was going to give, give uh, 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 I was going to give the point that occurred to me throughout when you were talking is that equality, which they want to increase, actually encourages competition because we only compete with those that we think we can. That's an old so, observation. So, 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 you know, in actual fact, the greater society of equality is, go, is going to introduce more competition, which is exactly what they don't want. So, more or less, you know, it's a bit like the old Wedgwood Ben thing of where he wanted more democracy but less bureaucracy, you know, because he came from the old left and the. The old liberal idea from the old left was no de- uh, no, no bureaucracy, and he, he embraced that. At the same time, he wanted more democracy, which intended towards more bureaucracy. So there is a contradiction in what they're saying. They're, they're, they're out to get rid of competition, but they're also out for more equality. But the more egalitarian society will be a more competitive one. Because people mean, we compete you with mean, equals. People don't need to get a little bit more to have more than other people. People tend to compete with people yes. who they think they're equal with. Yeah, because they've got a chance. Of yes, that's right. Yes, got a it means. Of yes, that's right. So, Whereas yeah. a, a hierarchy is the opposite. Uh, you know, I don't accept. Uh, I don't expect to marry the lady that uh, the prince is going to marry in, in a few months' time, simply because I'm of lower class. You see, but if I was the same classes. As him, I might compete with him and cause trouble and break up the erection, <laughs> break up the uh, break up, break up the, the royal wedding. <laughs> so, 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 he's lucky that I'm born in lower. Oh, yes. no, no. it was a close run thing, though. Oh, it wasn't. No, my, my parents were definitely in the lower class. <laughs> it was as high as they could get, David. Come on. Um, <laughs> There's a problem with the, apart from everything, it's a problem with the figures and the, the assumed cause of any lack of happiness. No doubt there is, no doubt they can find growing inequality. Even if it isn't there, they can find it. But the point is, even if it is there, that doesn't entirely explain, but just because it's there, there's a correlation. It may not be a cause. Going with the modern post war attempt to um, organise our happiness goes, for example, greater crime, greater feeling that you're being ordered to do this and that, order from pillar to post, the politicians seem to be demanding more and more, more and more diktats, more and more laws that aren't passed through Parliament, all this kind of thing, which is real and genuine. Uh, so the inequality of power doesn't seem to come into the equation at any point, mm-hmm. or it's equated with money. All, with income. all men are equal, but some men are more equal than others. Indeed. And some are doing, doing the equalising, and we're not equal in that. So it doesn't, does that, is that ever even acknowledged as a problem? No, that's, that's a big problem. They don't. Um, they automatically do income is status. No. So the, only, sense, the only status. Yeah, yeah that's it. That's why they're saying the, most, um, the part where it becomes most, well, dodgy, is where they are saying, one example where obesity increased over time is East Germany in the 1990s, after unification. Yeah? And as they're saying, that's because of increased uh, inequality then. Well, yeah, income inequality increased, but still East Germany in the 1990s was a much more egalitarian society in the sense of power relationships than, of course, in the 1980s, uh, with the uh, Stasi guys losing their jobs and so on. So I don't think anyone would have considered that as steeper hierarchies. You can make the same case um, when you compare modern Britain to the 1950s, even though Gini coefficients and that kind of stuff was very low in the 1950s, but um, I, don't know, I get the impression from any old movie and that that was a much more rigid hierarchical society. In a way. I'm not sure that there was more equal materially anyway, there are all these special places that the party members will go to for their holidays which weren't open to the ordinary worker and uh, as well, yeah. and shops where they could get luxury goods and so on which of course. the ordinary worker couldn't get so it was really Okay, yeah, I guess even if you discounted those uh, and that, that there is a Gini coefficient figure for, for specifically East Germany for the year 1990s that's maybe the closest reflection of yeah. Uh, equality under socialism, and it is very low, even below Denmark and Sweden. Could you say again, is that Gini coefficient? Mm-hmm. Named after? After Gini, Italian economist. Ah, ah, good. Never heard of the man. That's when, when you plot uh, the income distribution against a hypothetical distribution of perfect equality, and the divergence between the two, that I would see, be yes. inequality. A value of one would mean one individual owns everything, Value of zero would mean everybody is exactly equal. UK is somewhere in the mid, 
was 0.3 something, somewhere mid mid 30s. Cool. Yeah, but this book is, is as I said earlier, just the, the latest uh, shill argument to inflict the horrors of socialism on us. I'm just wondering who it's who it's designed to appeal to this argument, and it, it seems to me it's sort of aimed squarely at these sort of. Um, working mother type hags who were constantly going on about juggling their lifestyles and rushing around, they've got to take James to football and Sophie to ballet and uh, then they've got to go and work and hold down a full time job and they could come home and pay the nanny and cook the dinner and they can only afford to... It seems to be, it seems to, be to sort of to pander to the sort of factuous ego of the mum's net uh, type of woman. Uh, this is, it seems to be a book almost designed, designed to sort of flatter their silly egos and suck them into this sort of egalitarianism. They, they, their minds are already addled with green issues and, and you only have to listen to them for five minutes and every day at work I listen to them for more than this. Uh, and you, you, only have to, you only have to see how, how this book plays on all their silly ideas, and fatuous opinions about, about everything that preoccupies their tiny little minds. And you just want to say, well, well, leave work. Go and look after your children properly. Go and bring them up so they're not running yet. Do, do, do one or the other. And they're moaning. I mean, if you gave up juggling, they're always constantly juggling. Don't they? If they stop the juggling lessons, they might... They oh, might, really juggling? Yeah, they're yeah, they juggling in their time. <laughs> <They're metaphor>. Oh, <laughs> I see metaphorical juggling. <laughs> Uh, if, if you stop all this juggling, it, it, it seems to be a book designed to flatter these these people's egos, and sort of uh, so they can sort of talk about matter. Oh, wouldn't it be better if we didn't all have to constantly compete all the time? So moaning about how much they're doing is one of the latest cant uh, moralities that, uh, that that modern people say. You know, it's bo you boast about how hard you work all the time, and you pretend you're busier than you are, and uh, <laughs> that you, you, your, your life you, you try to make your life sound more exciting by pretending it's so difficult to manage and. Uh, you exaggerate all these things. It, it, it seems to me to be a book entirely designed to flatter to this, this utterly revolting and contemptible, <laughs> contemptible blight on our modern society a group of people. Them and others. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> Is it not the case? <laughs> Didn't know you. Are you expecting a response? Unfortunately, I don't know any of these people. Some of you are his best friends. No point. Empirical. A great deal of money is spent on internet pornography. I'm not sure how people show off to each other the amount they spend on internet pornography. As far as I can tell, they don't show off at all. <laughs> they seem, well, they seem to be the only resource, derive so, a considerable yeah. amount of happiness from it without knowing the consumption levels of others. But they haven't found the free sites yet. <laughs> so that would be the opposite of a web link good then. Yeah. It's like, just fun. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I get a great deal of fun out of feelings of misplaced superiority. It's very, <laughs> very cheap and uh, keeps you happy. No income so required. Increases happiness. Yeah, yeah. You can't give people a sense of superiority. Some of them don't deserve it. Uh, there, John? There is, there is a different way, uh, way around the problem. If you don't want to discourage productivity, and that's to enforce uh, a sort of economic uh, kneecaps so that you can earn as much as you like, but you must sort of put a big sort of wall around your property so nobody knows how much you've got or they can't see in and how much you're enjoying yourself or whatever. So you can see what's there and you can, you've got, you're motivated to get it, but nobody can be influenced by anybody else's. Uh, so it, it would be the equivalent of uh, sumptuary laws. To, to, uh, it, it, you can't, except you can, uh, enjoy luxuries, but you just you can't do it in public. Yeah, and you forbid the press to publish anything about what anyone else is making and getting in bonuses and so on. It's called yeah. a, it's called a party dasher. Though. But but that means yeah, we still have all the incentive, as it were, insofar as it was it wasn't motivated by envy. Uh, okay, that would be a non-bureaucratic solution to that. Just hide it from you, and that's so essentially what what it's about. It's it's um, and some some people have res responded to this by by. Uh, by saying that, yeah, but well, we both, both parties benefit and so on um, from, from trade, even if it's unequal. But that's that's the wrong response. They're not saying inequality means exploitation. They're not saying the wealthy are exploiting anybody. That is it's not the conventional social democratic argument. They're just saying it's the mere exposure to that luxurious lifestyle which makes us miserable, regardless of how they they earned it. Even if uh, they found a pot of gold and uh, 
didn't exploit anybody. In well, then, then ban Hello Magazine. Yeah, well, that would be part of it. That would be, part of it. That would be number one. Also, this idea of all wages go, all payments go to the government, which then sends them back minus tax to the recipient. That way, no one need know what you earn. Well, you'd have to advertise in the papers to get a job, I presume, but still, that'd be part of the, the way of managing it. Also, they can. But you would still see what other people consume. You'd, yes, you'd see that. You'd have to, you'd have to go for that solution that yes. uh, upwards from a certain level, only behind closed doors. Gated communities, big fence around. But that would tell you where the rich people live. <laughs> you know, as, long, as long as you don't know what happens no, 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 inside. No, that would be hush hush as well. Yeah, of they drive out in very small rat, ratty old cars. Mm -hmm. by, by, by law, you must. Oh, by law, you're flawed. Some trees, it would be some trees. Yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. Most of it is. is yeah. Did they work? Yes. Um, would there be a tax raising measure? Wait, wait, there's never an econ economic historian when you need one. Have you noticed <laughs> that? Where is James? In the library, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. SWAT. Yes. Anyone else want to contribute? Uh, where do you see this going? I mean, it's Recession City, so it's, it's Happinessville, isn't it? I mean, well, they've certainly made an impact. Um, it keeps being quoted. I don't see this going away. Well, that's because that's it, that's because it, rather like Keynes, it justifies tax subsidy prohibition prescription. That's part of it. I guess they're just speculating on the fact that, um, well, people realise there are responses, there are people who, who disagree, but that uh, you would just end up saying, okay, maybe they're overstating it a bit, but they're There's surely up to something. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. They're certainly up to something. <laughs> Whether they're on to something, it's not yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's always the danger in saying, well, we can't have complete equality. We, we all can agree that some movement towards it is a good thing. No, it isn't, especially given the means you're going to use. But that's a libertarian speaking of us. Yeah, but I guess that will be the conclusion uh, that will come out of it. Not all of it, but... No, all of it. no one's saying we go that far, of course. No one's saying we have to have different coloured dustbins and put them out on set days and you're fine if you don't have the lid screwed down. No one's saying that. No one's saying that. Not a chance. Mm. Right. Baker. The salami slicing is then, isn't it? They won't revolt. Just do it. All we really need is somebody who defends the idea to be... Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, that's right. It's nice to get one or two opposition speakers. Well, you I blame the chairman. Are <laughs> <laughs> you quite right? I'm, I'm, uh, the trouble yeah. is he invites them. That's why they don't come. <laughs> I invite them, but they, they turn me down. But, but yeah, yes, I ought to seek out one or two opposition speakers. Quite right. Shouldn't be too hard to find people supporting it. Oh, yes, yeah, no, but getting them to come to here. <laughs> <laughs> Should have well, there's no cheese and wine club yet. <laughs> to start. They, they turn out to be like Austin Mitchell, who agrees to come twice and doesn't turn up. Yes, yeah, so uh, that's a pity about Austin Mitchell. It's consistent. Yeah. Yes. You want that to He's a good speaker as well. <laughs> oh, it's effective. Is there anyone else in the box? Well, thank you very much indeed, Tristan. It's a marvellous talk. Very good. Talk. Yes,